Hello, my name is uh, Chris Ratcliffe, and today I'm going to do a talk called Vorsprung Dutch Hacknick, otherwise known as Why Cars Are Hackable and Hacking Them for Fun and Profit. A little bit of background about me, I've been a security professional for about a decade, um, but I've been a lifelong car fan. Um, anybody who follows me on Twitter, this is what I look like on there, this is what I look like in real life. Um, I drive racing cars, I drive my car on track, I drive other people's car on track, I take photos of cars on track, I talk awkwardly on YouTube while driving other people's cars, so today I'm doing one of those and not the other. And this, this is my car. And this is what has been really instrumental over the past what, three or four years about learning what makes up all the car systems that I'm going to talk about today. I'd love to say that I learned all about the 15 control units in the car, all the different buses, the protocols, the messaging formats, all of that sort of stuff by decompiling firmware, by probing the buses and what have you. I didn't. I googled it and found bmwtech.ru. The great thing about older cars, all this stuff ends up online. You can tell this is actually a uh, training manual from a dealer because at the end of each chapter it's got review questions. I'm also old enough to remember when car security wasn't about the internet. It was actually about stopping your car getting stolen. We had things like these. Uh, primary requirements for these, one, paint it yellow, two, misspell lock. <laughs> we then moved on. So we then had trackers, we then had aftermarket alarms. Um, we had fobs that would cycle through code, so if your mate pressed it in the pub, you couldn't get into your car. Um, but we've now moved on from simple aftermarket units to massively connected, really integrated cars. Before I go on, um, I just want to set up a few conventions. So, first of all, no two car manufacturers are the same. And often, no two cars from any one manufacturer are the same either. So I can't say that this will always be connected to this, which will always be connected to this. It seems that every car starts with a new piece of paper and a whole new idea about how to work it. The other thing is I'm going to talk about the car's computer system. Cars, massively variable. Some are very complicated, some are, some are very straightforward, some are very well integrated, some are very distributed. So I'm just going to refer to it as the car computer. And in fact, it's actually quite interesting, because if you look at how far cars have come, this is a wiring diagram from an original 70s Mini. And those of you who know your electronics will see relays and uh, buttons and things like that. And this actually only connects into the engine in two places. One for the starter motor and one for the alternator. And everything else was kind of standalone. By comparison, this is the diagram for the traction control system on my car. I wanted to get the whole diagram, the whole wiring diagram for the car, but it only exists on a DVD and it will only show you one portion at a time. So this is one system of many on a car and it hooks into both control systems, into hydraulic units, into the dashboard, all sorts. The thing that makes this work, the thing that connects all of these disparate systems together is a thing called CAN or CAN bus. You've probably heard it because it's the one thing that people often talk about. But what is it? So it's controller area network. It's a serial bus. Really, really simple. Messages go on. They're disc they're, they have a, um, an ID attached to them. If it's not for that particular item, it gets discarded. If Otherwise, it's read and acted on. It's not fast. Typically, a network within the car, so we're talking about things like electric windows, headlights, systems like that, running about 125 kilobits a second now, 500 kilobits for the engine where you need slightly higher speeds, slightly more bandwidth, and also less latency. Might be a single bus, might be multiple buses. It's entirely possible with some cars that, for example, the speed value, which is constantly put onto the bus and read by the dashboard, will be available across the whole car for some reason. 
where it's split into multiple buses, what we found with some hacks is that they have points where they're bridged. And we'll come back to that a bit later on. It's unencrypted, it's unauthenticated. The standard was put together in the 80s. This stuff was never even thought about. And it relies on physical security. If you can get into the car, you can hook at something into the network, you can start reading and writing to the bus. The door locks are kind of the only security that exists. Then nobody was ever really supposed to tap into it. And if you haven't got a sense of just how interconnected cars are, here's a very generic diagram that shows the sort of distributed system that we're talking about. Imagine any single component on a car probably has its own control system. Anything that has logic. So for example, if you've ever wound the window up and you've sort of stuck your hand in the way and it sensed it and dropped down, that's handled by a separate system from the one that controls the door locks or the sunroof or the dashboard or the gearbox or the suspension. Each one of these talks to each other. And it's sometimes not quite what you think. Um, ignore the check engine light. This is, this is my old focus. That's not why I sold it. Over on the left-hand side is the temperature gauge. And you think, okay, well, you know what a temperature gauge is. It shows the temperature of the engine. Except I noticed it only ever had two positions. It was either at cold or it's absolutely upright. And I thought either Ford have their cooling very, very accurate or that's not showing me the temperature. And essentially what, what I came to was that that has three positions. And based on what the temperature from the engine is read by the ECU, is sent to the dashboard controller, it will either be cold, okay, within parameters, or hot. And it will only ever be one of those three settings. That's actually more a fault indicator than it is a temperature gauge. Now, when I say physical security, it's worth pointing out that this is a network that runs a over a lot of the car. Even if you're like me and you're not a proficient lock picker or you're particularly skilled in that area, and you say, right, we're going to keep the bonnet shut, all of this under the car may have a gap where you can get your arm up and you can reach the wiring loom. If the car's parked on a curb, you can normally shuffle enough under the gutter, along the gutter, sorry, under the car to get to the wiring loom. Believe me, brushing uh, gravel and grit out the back of your hair is a really, really weird sensation. And here we've got the boots open as well. Well, in this car, the nav unit and all those sorts of things are in the boot. So guess what? If the boot's open, you can get to the CAN network. And that's even without unlocking the doors or setting the alarm off. Now, because it's physically secured, how do you ensure that nothing's tampered with? Nothing's authenticated, nothing's checking that it hasn't been tampered with. And think about when you leave a car unattended, but you give the keys to other people. How many times does somebody have full physical access to your car? Maybe when you take it to the garage? <coughs> Maybe when you're getting it cleaned? Maybe Valet Parker. <laughs> it's fair to say that sometimes hacking isn't the biggest thing you have to worry about. Love that scene. And this really has become more of an issue now, largely thanks to a paper that's put out by uh, Chris Valasek and Charlie Miller. Uh, well, well worth going onto the IO Active blog, having a read of this. Because what they did was that they took a couple of cars, one of which was a Prius, and they hooked into the CAN network. They went, okay, what can we do with it? Turns out you can do quite a lot because they'd gone inside the physical perimeter and there was nothing stopping them reading and writing from the CAN network, making the speedo read 199 miles an hour, accidentally crashing it into one of their own garages. For a reason I'll come back to later. But it's well worth looking at. And 
the Prius is also interesting because it's one of the first cars that came along where it got things like auto park. So you could be driving along and the car would look for certain conditions. So am I stationary? Am I in reverse? Am I going at less than five miles an hour? Well, it turns out if you flood the CAN bus, you can override some of those checks and have it try and parallel park while going forward at speed. <laughs> Now there's two ways you can patch into the CAN network. So first is something like this. And this is all the CAN bus actually is. It's nothing more complicated than a twisted pair. So you can get a transducer clip like that, run it through the appropriate software, you've got access. You may have to do that in some places, depending on if it is a segregated bus. Otherwise, a lot of people actually can connect to a CAN bus, initially at least, through this. Now some of you might recognize this few nods. Excellent. My people. So this is the onboard diagnostic port. Technically, it's the onboard diagnostic port 2. Um, it's the difficult second connector, but I think they did quite well with it. Um, first, put, first proposed in, early, in, sorry, in the late 80s, it's now become a standard around the world, a mandatory standard around the world. So it's appearing on, well, frankly, most cars that people here will ever come into contact with will have one of these ports. And there's certain things about the standard that make it really, really useful for people like us. So for one, it has to be in a standard location. It has to be somewhere within reach of the driver. It's often down in the footwell somewhere near the door. It has to be um, unencrypted. It has to be a standard connector. And anybody has to be able to connect to it. And you go, well, from a security point of view, why wouldn't you lock it down? The concern was that if you make it proprietary, if you make it locked down, suddenly only dealers can reset service indicators, can read error messages. And the only way you can get your car serviced is by going to a main dealer. And the argument was, well, if you can fix a car with spanners and with screwdrivers, Surely you should be able to do the same with electronics. So that's why this is open to anybody. And what makes it really fun as well is that this is the same connector that a garage might connect to read an error code, that the factory used to set the cars up, that main dealer will connect to when they're changing a major component. So this actually has a lot of power and a lot of data going through it. Again, we'll come back to this in a bit more detail later. But this is, I'm guaranteed, some of you will now go back to your cars and you'll start pulling off bits of trim trying to find this connector. It's there somewhere. It has to be. So connected cars, I'm not going to go through, through this in too much detail because Scott just did a fantastic job uh, in the previous talk. Um, one thing, sorry, I had to jump out because I was taking photos as well. One thing with this, and this applies to all cars, where in this model... Are you restricting access? Where in this model are you confirming what commands can be sent to the car? Who can send them? Where they come from? All of these sorts of questions. You see, some of you may be more familiar with Chris Valasek and uh, Charlie Miller. Thank you. I keep getting the Charlie Daniels band in my head. You know, the devil went down to Georgia. I don't know why. I keep getting stuck on that. So they, what they found was really interesting with the Jeep, which was you've got the app, the app talks to the manufacturer, manufacturer talks to the car. Okay, that's fine. What they found was that the car had a certain uh, GSM provider and it had an open port to the internet. And you could actually scan an IP range and start finding cars open to the internet. Not only that, the CAN bus is basically open on these cars to the internet because the controls about what could actually be run are set in the app and they're controlled up in by the manufacturer. So by the time you get here, the communication is trusted unless you go straight to the car. Now what's really worrying is that there's one function uh, that all cars have, that, well, cars with ABS, and that is a facility to bleed the brakes. Now with ABS, what you need to do 
is you need to open up a series of pumps and you need to make sure there's lots and lots of uh, space to get all the, all the fluid through, get all the air out. While you're doing this, because it's basically retracted all of the brake system, if you press the pedal, nothing happens. Now this is fine when you're standing still. What they found with the Prius was that they could send that command to the car while it was moving. And this was why, as they rolled slowly into one of their garage, they pressed the brake pedal, nothing happened, and they crashed into the shelves at the back. This is in their paper, by the way. The photo's brilliant. <laughs> but it's legitimate. So if you're plugging directly into a car, it kind of makes sense that that's what a mechanic would do. He'd plug his service computer in, put it into a bleed mode, while it's stationary or up on a lift, bleed it, reset, you're good to go. With this, they found they could send that same message to the car while it was moving at speed, remotely. So they're driving along, and you can find a car, not know whose car it is, but you can just start sending a message to the car that says, by the way, put it into a brake bleed mode. Press the pedal, nothing happens. There was no check, there was no mitigation. There was nothing that stopped that happening, either within the car or within the, the systems of the car, but they somehow left it so open that even diagnostic modes were available remotely. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, the, there was a similar attack that was uh, publicized recently. Pentest Partners found they could hack a Mitsubishi Outlander uh, hybrid. What makes this really interesting? Not that they could hack it, not that they found, again, the CAN bus was kind of open and there was all sorts of odd features that you could trigger remotely, but that it was using Wi-Fi. Because what that means is you can only access the car while you're within range. And it actually turns out the Wi-Fi range wasn't very good anyway. Now, why would Mitsubishi do this via Wi-Fi? My guess, <laughs> turns out you ring up Mitsubishi press office, they don't tell you. My guess is, it's quick, it's cheap. You don't need to put all the back end in. You don't need to put all the GSM connectivity into all the cars. You just put a Wi-Fi module in, you have your app form an ad hoc network, job done. Which leads us on to the first persistent threat with connected cars. Marketing. <laughs> I've got this great idea. Let's have a connected car. What's the quickest way we can do this and get it to market? Well, we can't afford all that. Let's just stick it on Wi-Fi. It's the same thing. You must have friends who tell you, I saw this thing on Kickstarter. It's like a little card, and you clone all of your other credit cards onto this one thing, and then it uploads all those details to the cloud, and you can access your credit cards from anywhere. And at some point, there's like a spidey sense when it comes to security. <laughs> It's what I call the raised eyebrow of security. <laughs> you kind of go, OK, carry on. <laughs> and I was reminded of this. Last year, um, Audi started a pilot with DHL and Amazon. And certain cars in Germany, you could tell Amazon where your car was going to be parked. Seriously, this looks like <laughs> this looks like I've mocked it up. This is absolutely true. Tell them where your car's parked. They will come, unlock your boot with a secure one-time only option, leave your parcels in your boot, and then go. I don't know about you. <laughs> my boot's full of crap that I don't want people going through. And also, I can drop the seats in my car. So once the boot's open, you can then get into the rest of the car which then gets us back to the CAN bus thing. I don't know if they've carried this on. I can't find any reference to this past about April, so I'm hoping that somebody went, really? <laughs> and I kind of get the same thing with the apps as well. So here we've got, on this end, we've got the Ford Escape app. And you'll notice, unlock, engine start, lock quite common with connected cars, except this is connected to the internet and your car can be anywhere in the world. 
why do you need to start the engine when you're anywhere in the world? And I asked my wife, I said, unlock and lock. When might you need to unlock the car when you're substantially away from it? And we could only really come up with really, really tenuous cases. And the same, so we've got BMW i app in the middle. Again, okay, light flash. I can kind of get, you can't find your car in a car park. Flash the lights, oh, there it is. Horn, same thing. If those get, if those two get, uh, get misused, okay, it's a bit awkward, but you can't really do any danger. But lock and unlock. Again, we've got this thing where you go, well, why would you want it in an app? This one's interesting. This is the uh, Volvo's app. So again, we've got engine start, engine stop. What it says is, if you want the heater running, you've got to have the engine running. Okay, still not comfortable that sitting outside my house would be my car with the engine running. There is actually a precedent for this, actually, by the way. I've just remembered. The Ford F-150 pickup truck in the States, they had a feature that would allow you to leave the engine running while you're outside the vehicle. They tried to get rid of it a few years ago. There was complaints, so they brought it back. So. You're driving through America, it's freezing cold, snow on the ground, engine's running, car's nice and warm. You want to go into a shop, get coffee, whatever. You can get out the car, lock the door, and set a four-digit combination code on the door, go in, get your stuff, unset it again, key's still in ignition, away you go. I don't know why that hasn't taken off around the rest of the world, but there we go. So the question is, why? Why put the functionality in? Are you doing it because you want to fulfill a marketing requirement? Is there somebody going, hey, wouldn't it be really cool if you could do this? Or is there actually a use case? Or to put it another way, it's like Goldblum's law. You know Goldblum's law? You were so preoccupied with whether you could, you didn't stop to think if you should. And this is the problem with car manufacturers is that they're not really that great with electronics. Um, I will caveat by this by saying that Tesla actually do a lot of their own electronics. If you look at the, some of the teardown stuff, people found it's got Tesla branded PCBs, they make their own motors, they make their own batteries. They're basically a technology company that makes cars. Traditional car companies though, they kind of struggle with electronics. Um, they do things like this, they press metal, they weld it together. It's the heavy industry stuff. Um, in fact, Subaru's parent company is Fuji Heavy Industries. They're designed for sort of handling lumps of steel. Um, some of them make engines, but they don't cast pistons. They don't make all the bits that go into the engine. They sort of screw them together. And then on the production line, well, they screw cars together and they paint them and they ship them out to customers. But what they don't do is they don't make every single part of a the car. They buy them in. There's a whole raft of manufacturers. You can go through and you can get a catalog and you can buy everything you need to make a car. The problem is, what happens when those parts have a problem? So on the left, we've got a clutch pedal from a Toyota. Toyota, you know, clever car company. They use that on every single model. Save money, buy in bulk, be cheap. It's only a throttle pedal. And then it failed and it started sticking. That caused 4.2 million cars to be recalled and fixed under warranty in the US, Europe, and China. On the right, oops, sorry, on the right is an airbag from a Japanese company called uh, Takata. To 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 what they did was that they actually changed the way that the airbags fire. So the, you've got the little explosive inside, and they went for a cheaper explosive. And they found over time, yeah, not really, not really a phrase you want to hear. <laughs> they found over time it absorbed moisture and it would either not go off in the event of an accident or it would go off randomly. <laughs> and it killed some people. This has caused somewhere between 15 and 20 million cars around the world to be recalled. This is, I've actually had this on my car as well. Some people actually say it's, it's even a higher figure than that. And recalls are only ever led by safety. It's the rule of Fight Club, you know, if the cost of the, uh, the claims is less than the cost of the recall, then I can't remember which way around it is. Anyway, <laughs> and, don't, and this isn't a trivial thing either. In the States, the obligation to change out components that are faulty for safety reasons is enormous. 
to the point that cars that people know are affected but are, aren't on a dealer database or anything like that, they're private investigators trying to track down these cars and who owns them so they can inform them that this needs to be replaced. You know, it's costing the company billions of dollars and it's potentially putting the company at risk. Now, there's actually a security um, problem a bit like this. So there was a researcher, can you read that? Well, kind of. So there's a researcher um, who found a problem in door lock modules. So this was a, a product called uh, Megamos. And it had um, PKI crypto between the key fob and the car. And they found a vulnerability in it. VW took out an injunction to stop the research being presented because it would affect all of their cars and potentially put their customers at risk. It wasn't the manufacturer of the part, it was actually the people who buy those components and it would have affected all of their cars that were currently on sale. VW fought this for two years before this is now uh, out in its public knowledge. Um, they relented for some reason. Um, also, I don't know why they've put a 911 GT1 on there, but hey, it's a nice picture. But this was all about VW protecting their reputation through legal means, not by fixing the problem. And it actually turned out, once the uh, papers were published, it actually had a list of all of the cars and all the manufacturers that the author had identified weren't, were, uh, were affected. So this isn't even necessarily an exhaustive list, but you can see, you know, you've got trucks, you've got Ferraris, you've got VWs, you've got Opals, you know, it goes across the board. And all because a component that is bought in has a vulnerability that, well, car manufacturers can't fix because it's already in the car. If you want to fix the vulnerability, you have to buy a new car. It's almost security as a selling point. And this is where the car industry really suffers with a legacy problem. <laughs> I'm glad you're laughing, I quite like that one. You see, let's have, so we'll put up on the left-hand side, every iPhone that's been on sale since November 2009. And each one is functionally better, more secure, has extra security functions that have come in. Battery life never changes, but hey, you can't have everything. But each year, it's gotten better. And then on this side, let's put every BMW 5 Series model that's been created over the same time period. That hasn't changed in seven years. The technology that went into this is largely the same as it has been for seven years. And you think about, well, okay, well, what were the vulnerabilities like seven years ago? Okay, they might have upgraded parts of it, but if you change one component, you've got to then test it with everything else, and you've got to support multiple components, and car manufacturers don't want to do that. When the uh, Chrysler Jeep um, attack was publicized, they went, well, what do we do? And they sent out a USB stick to every registered owner and said, hi, here's a USB stick. Plug it into your car, please install the software. Because that's not a vector that anybody else can abuse. <laughs> it's really cheap to buy branded USB sticks and there are people who won't ask why you're buying them. Again, um, shout out really to Tesla who have over the air updates built into the cars and owners have this kind of slightly weird sensation where they'll come to their car in the morning and they've found new functionality has been enabled overnight, which is kind of cool. And it's not just security. Um, so this is 2003. Um, Eddie Q on the right announces iOS in the car, which then later becomes Apple CarPlay. And you think, great, think about Apple, think about how quickly you can normally get your hands on the new latest and greatest tech. By the end of the following year, four car manufacturers, sorry, five car manufacturers had started integrating it over about 10 cars. And even now, when we're three years on from the announcement, there's actually not that many cars. There's only now starting to become cars, uh, become a, a, a stream of cars that have this enabled because it just wasn't in the plan and in the longer term strategy to enable it. Um, curiously, one of the first manufacturers to enable it across the whole range was uh, Ferrari. Um, now, this might be because it's premium, it might be because it's high-end, or it might be because this man sits on the board of Ferrari. <laughs> and I thought, okay, well, 
if we've got old technology in cars, well, how old is it? And again, I asked a few people and they said, yeah, we're not going to tell you. Um, but through a bit of research and through a few conversations, I came up with this sort of timeline based on, again, my car. So starting off with an OEM, so an original equipment manufacturer having an idea for a product, getting it signed off internally, getting the buyer to sign it off, getting it delivered for integration testing, compliance, heat testing, durability testing, and then actually getting it into the car is somewhere around two years. So you say, okay, well, when's the configuration going to be locked? Well, kind of here. My car is, um, was made in 2003. So I've got something in my car that was there on the 2000 release, which would have been delivered to uh, BMW in 1999, so it's four years old. I also have an analog TV tuner that now has no signal it can pick up and a tape deck. I can't complain too much. But this is the problem. Because cars are so integrated, because they're tested, because they need to be reliable, you can't just throw in new tech. And it's now so integrated that you can't even swap out the stereo like you used to. Can on my car, yes. You can't start taking units out because everything's coded to everything else and you've got a feed from the engine and a feed from the, the tire pressure gauge that comes upon the display and comes upon the navigation. All of that sort of stuff is so integrated. So it's, we've kind of painted ourselves into a corner. The great thing for us is that this is something you can play with. And if you've ever wanted to get into control systems uh, engineering and hacking, well, guess what? You've probably got a test lab sitting on your drive. And you can interrogate CAN. You can read these messages without it interfering with the function of the car as, as well. You know, just see what it's doing. So if you want to hack your car for fun, what can you do? Well, let's start off with Easter eggs. There is stuff that your car can do that won't be in the manual. Because car manufacturers call it surprise and delight. It's like, oh, it does this. I didn't know it did this. And the forums are full of car owners going, hey, did you know if you flick the indicator stalk and do this and it'll do that and this light will come on? Isn't that fantastic? You can also get um, engineer menus, diagnostic menus. So again, a series of pre button presses and flicks and what have you can bring up extra information about the car. All there, none of it's usually documented, but it's all around on the forum, so it's worth having a Google. Second thing, you can buy a um, little adapter that goes into the onboard diagnostic port. Um, I've actually got one of these. It's a GoPoint uh, Bluetooth unit. Integrates with iOS, integrates with Android, has its own nice app, and you can start reading data out the canvas. So you can read the error codes, you can reset service lights. You can even start seeing things like speed and revs and other data that might be available. It's also a really good uh, little way of um, building a data logger if you fancy going on track and download another app like Harry's Laptimer. But it's really simple. You plug it in, connect to it via Bluetooth, open the app, and the data's there. It's easy to use. It's easy to, easy to read. Then you start getting a bit more serious. So there's things like a VAGCOM cable if you've got a VW Audi group car. Again, plug it in, you can start getting more into the depths of how the car's configured, how it's built. Um, econ cable, again, a more generic version of the same thing. Uh, lastly, if you want to get really, really into it, you can even get things like um, Arduino shields. So you can build a, a system that integrates into the car and actually reads and can transmit actually quite a lot of data. I would advise, actually, again, if you read the, um, the IOActive papers, it goes into great detail about what they use, how they use it, what techniques are, what they found. It's fantastically rich information. Now, for me, one thing that I really like is getting something for nothing. Come on, who doesn't? So, after my car was released, BMW brought out this, which is the M3 CSL. At the time, it was about 30% more than my car cost. It's now worth about 10 times what my car cost. And it's got some special bodywork, some special wheels, a carbon fiber roof, some really nice little features, but crucially, it has a third setting on the traction control somewhere between on and off. So it's not as restrictive, but you've still got a safety net. And I thought, that would be really, really cool on my car. 
turns out what BMW did when they, when they made this was they got the bespoke bits, so they got the bits that only ever appeared on this car. The electronics, they actually then put onto every single production car and just turned off the nice new things. So how do you, but how do you enable things like that? You know, it's not like a dash option, it's not there in the, in the navigation. What you really need, something like, say for example, if you had the software that the factory used to set cars up when they rolled off the production line. I'll be honest, you have to use a fair bit of Google Translate. But you, you load this onto a laptop, you connect to the car, you connect to the module, you pull down a config file, which is a simple text file, and you start getting settings like this. The Google Translates are mine. Um, I don't know what the under control threshold is, but I quite like it. The override something I, it, Google couldn't actually deal with. Um, but this is essentially, what BMW do is they put a nice part in and they turn off a load of functions thinking that you can't get to it. But guess what? You go onto the forums, lots and lots of people have gone through this process. The software's out there. And you can actually go further than this if you want. That's an aftermarket ECU. All it does is basically control how much fuel and air and spark goes into the engine and makes the car move. Take yours out, put that in, configure it however you want. Or if you're a bit more of a hobbyist, it's a thing called a mega squirt that comes as a kit. <laughs> now, you, you might ask, who's the sort of person who'd use this? Well, some people have it set up on a bench and they connect to it and they test it. Other people say that if they had a Golf from the 80s, they'd built their own aerodynamic kit out of fiberglass in their, <laughs> in their garage. They bought turbo parts off eBay and they built their own ECU. I love this car. <laughs> Guy who owns it, just he has no sense that he can't do anything. He just builds it and it's is fantastic. Okay, so you've had some fun with your car. Tell you what, let's do it for profit. So what could you do? Bug bounties, believe it or not. Um, Fiat Chrysler actually announced this week that they're doing one with Bug Crowd. Um, General Motors do one with Hacker One. Tesla do, uh, do one with Bug Crowd as well. And Elon Musk has even tweeted about people that have found stuff in the firmware of their cars. So he's actually quite on board with it. General Motors, not so much. Um, if you read the terms and conditions, there's basically about a dozen ways they can sue you. Um, automotive security testing. A couple of companies are starting to do this. Pentest Partners, IOActive are starting to do security testing. But there isn't a central body. There's no Euro NCAP, there's no Thatchum for car security testing probably should be at some point. Defensive security products. I saw one um, announced this week. Basically, it fingerprints the clocks on each control module and can detect if a message is either legitimate or it's spoofed or it's faked or it's um, somehow interfering with the, with the system. This is the first product that I've seen which actually is trying to stop this stuff being mucked about with. And again, huge growth area because cars are only going to become more complicated and we're going to get to a point fairly soon where you're installing antivirus and firewalls and stuff onto your car. <laughs> um, enabling remaps. So I'll go into what remaps are in a minute. Um, some car, car companies now, more and more, they want to stop you fiddling with the bits, the computers on the, on, on the car. Because they can make it unreliable, they can have uh, problems about, well, if there's an insurance claim or if they, frankly, if you get more performance that you don't pay for. So when this car came along, um, the GTR, when it first was launched, the, <laughs> just out of the corner of my eye, the, um, <laughs> the ECU was actually kind of uncrackable. And it was actually a good few months until somebody found a way to put a new engine map into it. And there was actually a monetary um, reason to be, be the first to do that. Some others, um, some can be flashed like this, so they can be, uh, you can have new software uploaded to them. Others, they have physical controls, so you've got to actually crack the ECU open and solder in a jump lead or take a link out or something to put it into a, um, into a writable mode. 
but somebody's got to find that stuff out before it can then be productionized and sold. Um, by the way, if you're wondering what an engine map actually is, so this is a representation of how much fuel and air goes into a car under different uh, circumstances, so amount of throttle, amount of load the car's under, and so on. Except it's not this simple. Cars have multiple engine maps depending on if the engine's cold, if the engine's hot, if the fuel grade is low, if the fuel's very, uh, very premium fuel, if the, car's, if the car develops a fault. Some of you might have heard or even experienced a limp home mode where it puts it into a very, very safe engine map. Now, this is normally developed on a, a rolling road like this, and you'll notice this is rear-wheel drive, so you've got rear wheels spinning on a roller, front wheels are stationary. Now, if you were doing it with a front-wheel drive car, obviously you'd have it the other way around, so the front wheels would be moving, the back wheels would be stationary. The other thing that you would get on a rolling road with a front-wheel drive car is the, the steering wheel would always be facing forward. So if you know that front wheel's moving, the rear wheels are stationary, steering wheel's pointing forward, it must be on a rolling road, therefore it might be having an emissions test. <laughs> and if, theoretically, you were to have the car drop into a particularly lean engine map, you would get great fuel economy figures in a test lab, and you'd get very low emissions. Now, I'm not saying that anybody has done this. <laughs> Theoretically. And then once you develop new maps, so with the GTR now, you can actually buy a device like this. Um, ah. Oh, come on. So you can, you can buy a device that will plug into the um, onboard diagnostic port, and you can then upload new maps to it. That functionality has now been enabled, and you can now change maps on the fly to either have it very economical, very, very performance driven. Um, or anywhere in between. Now, my, I've lost my remaining slides. So, <laughs> the future of connected cars. So, I've talked a lot about CAN. CAN as a physical medium is kind of on its last legs. It's been around since the 80s. What's replacing it is going to be Ethernet. So, guess what? All the things that we know about, sorry? Sorry. So all the things that we know about Ethernet security now can be applied to cars. You can have segmented networks, you can have VLANs, you can have authentication. You can now be sure that what's talking to each other is actually what's supposed to be talking to each other. You've got the implementation of, uh, you're going to start seeing certificate authorities on cars, crypto being brought into cars to make sure that things haven't been altered. The only way that you'll be able to load a new, um, some new uh, data or some new licenses effectively onto the car is through having a signed file that can only be signed by the manufacturer from their CA. And the reason this is important is because somewhere down the line, we won't be driving cars, well, actually, it's a Tesla. We're going to be moving towards autonomous cars. And the liability issues around if an autonomous car gets hacked or gets upgraded or gets tampered with suddenly becomes very real and very big for the manufacturers. So they need to be able to prove if a car's been tampered with, that they're not actually liable for those issues. So suddenly, instead of having people like us tinkering in our garages, we're going to start seeing a lot of this stuff's locked down until those keys start escaping from the manufacturers, and then we'll be going through a loop of cars being hacked again. And because cars are put in production for five or ten years, we kind of won't be able to fix it if those keys get out. Lastly, the other thing that we're going to have it's a load of cars on the road where the security on them is essentially obsolete. So think about all the websites that used to have SHA-1 certificates, now SHA-2 certificates. Think of all the um, phone upgrades that happen that improve the security of those devices over time. A manufacturer is going to go back and retrofit those improvements onto older cars? No. Once those cars become vulnerable, they will continue to be vulnerable and those exploits will become more widely known and I think some of them will end up in the hands of enthusiasts and will be hacked in fantastic ways and others will suddenly become very vulnerable for just cutting out, being stolen and we're going to start seeing security as a selling point. And that 
is kind of a really frustrating way to be when you can't upgrade it. So the only way you can actually keep yourself secure on an ongoing basis is to keep buying new cars, which you kind of think the manufacturers might actually like. So I'll leave you on that thought. Um, thank you very much for, for coming. Thank you very much for attending. Um, before you dash off, one last piece of uh, news. So uh, Robin said we've got gift bags left over. If anybody wants an additional gift bag worth 20 quid-ish, go down uh, where the registration uh, tables were, go down, make a donation, and you can grab an additional bag. Thank you very much.